You know, um, 17 years ago when I first arrived in the United States, when I used to tell people I'm from Iraq, they would take a step back. And I would tell them, I really don't have guns. And there has been a lot of change. Now people just tell me, I'm sorry. Uh, so thank God. And everyone should be sorry, I think, to what's happening in Iraq. But growing up in Iraq meant I grew up in war. And what I saw of war is the two um, sides of the coin. One side we always discuss in the newspapers and in our coverage of war in America, which is the frontline discussion. We talk about war from the trunks and the tanks and the planes and the bullets and the killing and the soldiers. And that is one aspect of war. It is true. It happens. Um, we all feel it. But there's another aspect of war that we really do not discuss as much as we should discuss. Sometimes we do not, do not discuss at all. And that is the backline discussion of war. And that, is, that has everything to do with life. How do you keep life going in the midst of war? War for me about actually how do we go to school? Uh, and what do we do if the missile land in the middle of the, uh, in the right to school? War for me was uh, discussing with my family whether we should all sleep in the same room, so if a missile uh, land on our house, we would die together, or whether we should sleep in each other in different rooms and just take a risk. War for me is about fear. It's about waking up in the middle of the night, seeing a missile land on someone else's home, and secretly thanking God that it's not on my family today. And in the process, I started actually working with women survivors of wars, and I started learning war. If anything, it's partially about the frontline discussion, but it's really partially about how do we keep life going. Talking about Bosnia, war for me is walking in the middle of Sarajevo, in the middle of the besiege, and hearing music coming out of the music school. And when I got inside the school, all the teachers were women and said, that's our resistance to the war, is to keep the school open every single day and to keep the teachers teaching the piano and the violin and the cello and that's the students with their headscarf and their uh, uh, jackets and their gloves and their scarves playing in the midst of the cold. And it was very cold. War for me is about a Sudanese woman that I recently met in Sudan. And when I asked her what does war mean for her, that woman walked for 18 years in her life. In southern Sudan, mind you, Sudan is not uh, Darfur. Sudan is the size of Western Europe, and when we only talk about Darfur, it's like talking only Fran from France's perspective about World War II. Now, this woman was from southern Sudan, who recently finished a war after 20 years of fighting. And she walked for 18 years of her life and never slept in, more, in one place more than five nights, because a couple of times she was kidnapped and became a sexual slave, where she was raped as much as the soldiers wanted and carried their ammunition and their water and their food for them. So when I asked her what peace meant for her, not war, and she thought about it for a second and she said, peace means I have toenails. She didn't have toenails for 18 years when she walked. And peace is as simple as having toenails. We need to understand war and we need to understand peace from the toenails perspective. Because at the end of the day, this is what, what we're talking about. It is not about the fighting. And we need to understand how, because when, when it's about the fighting, then peace is about simply the signing of a peace agreement, and it is not. It is about how my life is going to improve. Someone talked about what do we do in Iraq. Someone asked the uh, previous uh, panel, what do we do in Iraq? I was in Iraq right after uh, the invasion, when, when the invasion started. And someone grabbed me and said, America just came to someone who's been in a coma for 35 years. And the first thing you ask someone who just woke up from a coma is not what kind of democracy you want or who do you want to vote for, it's what do you want to eat and what do you want to drink. And unless we ask that question, we are missing out on what peace means. And that's where women come. It's perhaps the most unfair thing for women to be cornered as victims in war. We are victims. We are victim, uh, women are victimized in major ways in war. And 90% of modern war casualties are civilians, 75% of which are women and children. 80% of the worldwide refugees in the world are women and children. And the only group of people who are leading the backline discussion of how to keep life going 
are women, yet we do not hear their voices. I find it amazing that the only group of people who are not fighting, not pillaging, not raping, not burning, not even creating rebellious groups, and the only ones who are actually keeping life going are not included at the negotiating table. I really find it amazing. We really need to understand what war means and what peace means from a woman's perspective. Because at the end of the day, that's what they're dealing with. And I say that not only for ideological reasons, I say that for pragmatic reasons as well. Women are bellwether for the directions of the society. Violence often starts through women, and progress often starts with women. And there are many examples. I see women as like, we're the kitchen door to the family house, and when things enter through the kitchen door, you don't notice it as much as when things enter through the main door. Well, look at Afghanistan. And look at the Taliban. The first acts of violence they committed were against women. And everyone looked on the side and they said, it's just women. It's just their religion, their culture, whatever it is. We actually were inviting them here in America, speaking to the Congress about the oil pipe to go through Afghanistan. Well, eventually every single man, child, and woman was impacted by that violence. Eventually the United States was impacted by that violence. And the whole world, one can argue, was impacted by that violence. The world changed after September 11. If we look at Iraq, the first acts of kidnapping in Iraq in 2003 actually were against women, within months, within two months of the invasion. And everyone looked on the other side, it's just women, it's trafficking, that's normal. Well, eventually every single person is kidnapping and getting kidnapped in Iraq. A foreigner or Iraqi, doesn't matter. We need to look at women as a bellwether for the society. We also need to, in terms of what's happening, what is the direction, because violence starts with women, but progress also starts with women. I talked about how it's unfair to corner women as the victims uh, only in war, because we are victimized, you know, from 900,000 German women raped in World War II to 400,000 Bangladeshi women raped in 71, 20,000 Bosnian women raped in, in the midst of the 90s, 500,000. 500,000 Rwandese women raped in 100 days in 1994, and as we speak right now, hundreds of thousands of Congolese women are getting raped. Right now. So that's one story of women being victimized, but that's not the end of the story. They are also standing on their feet, and they are keeping life going, perhaps for many reasons. Their resilience, their courage, but also because they have children and they have to keep on, they have to keep on going. And in that case, investing in women becomes a national interest. If I talk about Rwanda, it's one thing to say 500,000 women got raped in 100 days, and that's true. And it's the most unfair thing to stop the discussion right now on Rwandese women. Because 13 years later, after Rwanda's genocide, 49.9% of the Rwandese parliament are women. 50% of all the ministers are women. Every single ministry has a gender budget, including the defense ministry. And when you ask the president of Rwanda and you ask the Rwandese society, why are you doing this? They said, we cannot build our country without the full inclusion of women in every single decision-making process. There is no way we can build our strong, and this is not only Rwanda, I would say everyone, there is no way one can build strong democracy, strong demo economies, um, strong peace without the full inclusion of women. There is pragmatic reasons. There's also pragmatic reasons why we include women, and someone mentioned in the old panel about how do we, we may win, I think uh, it was you, um, Mufti, how we may win the war, but we may not win the peace. I don't think we're even winning the war. You're actually losing the war in the streets. This is the era of the streets. I work in countries like Afghanistan, like Iraq, like Rwanda, like Congo, and the streets is dominated by extremist groups who are, is what I call it, they are giving the rice sack. They go to a widow in Afghanistan or in Iraq and say, here's a rice sack, give us one son, and feed the seven other children. And every single widow is having no choice but to choose the rice sack. It's not an ideological support of extremism. And unless we compete at the rice sack level, Unless we say, here's a rice sack, but we're also going to teach your kids and we're going to help you get a job, we are losing the street. We are losing this war in every single way. 
We need to compete not by fighting over the arms and the weapons. We need to compete in the street by actually helping people eat. And, and that's what we do at Women for Women International. Uh, 14 years ago, I started this group from zero, nada, nishta, rian, wala, ishi. Um, I was 23 years old. I had just arrived to America about two years, uh, well, three years uh, ago. And it was my first awareness of the of other wars beside the ones that was going on in, in Iraq. Again, I quote you again about what you said. I learned about the Holocaust and about the concentration camps in Bosnia the same month. I was, it was my first time to learn about the Holocaust and when I went to university in here. And while for you who learned it in high school, you may just been you know, used to the never again. I actually learned it the same month, so the never again seemed very hypocritical when it was happening to Bosnia right now in front of my eyes. And that was inspire, what to inspire this uh, starting of Women for Women International. Now the ideology of the group is saying each individual should take ownership of their own voices and our own resources and just reach out to the world for God's sake. <laughs> You know, it's easy to get depressed reading the newspaper. I get depressed sometimes reading the newspaper and watching the news. It is much harder to say, you know, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to be helpless in this uh, war. So we have an appeal for every single woman around the world to sponsor one woman at a time by, by sending her $27 a month, along with a letter to start communication link between the two women. We do have men, too, who sponsor with their daughters, wives, or sisters or mothers. <laughs> um, it's a form of public diplomacy. You know, you go around, you leave America, and America is seen as a superman, as a, this concrete giant country that is either destroying us or is so out there we cannot reach. And you need to humanize America. And that's what we really try to do with the sponsorship program. Once someone who's reaching out to a Fatima in Iraq and saying, I care about you, America becomes about Mary who is sending the letter to Fatima and helping her. I don't know, I, call, I don't know what's the equivalent, the female equivalent of average Joe, so I call it average Mary. So an average Mary is reaching out to an Af Beatrice or, or Fatima or Aisha or whoever in all over the world in different war zones and saying, I care about you. In the process of living through war and working in war, I learned war is like a flashlight on humanity. It shows you the worst of humanity, so through acts that are unbelievable. But it also shows you the best of humanity. And it's, it could be that, um, that neighbor who just helped you out of the blue or that letter you received from a stranger who doesn't know who you are saying, I care. Now, I call it our own form of public diplomacy because I, of so many experiences. I was once in Iraq, and an Iraqi woman was spreading rose water on her a letter from uh, her sister in America. And I was like, you spreading rose water? Rose water for us is a holy water. We use it in religious ceremonies and in weddings and in funerals. And she said, but she is saving my life. Of course I, I spread rose water on her letter. This is how we reach the hearts and minds of people, is when an Iraqi woman is praying for an American woman for saving her life, or when a Congolese woman is praying for a Bangladeshi woman for saving her life. And we have 52 other countries, sponsors from 52 other countries. Now, what started as from zero, eventually, 14 years later, was featured seven times on the Oprah Winfrey Show. We helped directly 120,000 women, not only through the sponsorship program, but got women's rights training, vocational skills training, and at the end of the one-year program, we helped them get jobs and stand on their feet, because that's how we measure peace. And we were, and we were now helping 35,000 women on a monthly basis. One of the questions I was asked to address here, what is, uh, what is the secret? What is, what is the lesson you learned in the, in the journey? I learned many things. Each drop makes a difference. This, this whole thing, 35,000 women a, woman, uh, a month is a drop. But the drop does fall a bucket, and the bucket does fall a bathtub, and the bathtub does fall eventually a lake or an ocean. But I also learned it's all about our personal journey. So the very women I was supposed to help I was supposed to you know, help them stand on their feet and move from victim to survivor to active citizens, ended up helping me. 
I not only am from Iraq, and I not only survived the war in Iraq, but my father was Saddam Hussein's pilot. And I grew up knowing Saddam Hussein very, very, very well. I saw him every single weekend. I called him uncle. I uh, hang out with him. And, and being that close to the devil meant you were only that much closer to danger. And it didn't mean we were safe from danger. We, we had lots of privileges, but it didn't say, mean we were safe from danger. And I was so afraid of telling my story to anybody. I was so afraid. I was living in my own silence, and I came to America, and I started my life from zero, and I vowed never to tell that to anybody because I was convinced if I told anybody I knew Saddam Hussein, that my own identity, my own, my own beliefs, my own values, my own accomplishment will all disappear, and all what you will see is Saddam Hussein. And it took me, one of the women that we were helping, actually, to tell me about why is it important to break the silence. So it was a Congolese woman. Her name is Nabitu. Was, she was raped. Her nine-year-old daughter was raped. Her 21-year-old daughter was raped. Her 22-year-old daughter was raped. Her sons were forced to spread her mo their mother's legs and hands apart. And one of them was asked to rape his mother. And when, they, when he refused, they shot him in the foot. And when she looked at me, she said, I never told anybody but you my story. So I told her, what do you want me to do? Because I would come here and give a speech and tell everyone, the, the whole world, about your story. And she looked and said, if I can tell the whole world about my story, so other women would stop, would not face what I face, I would. But I, but I can't. You can. You go ahead and tell the story, just not the neighbors. <laughs> well, I always was confused why people would laugh at the neighbors, but then I realized everyone is afraid of telling the neighbors. Um, when, and it's, it's, she, it was her what inspired me to write my story and to tell my story and to stand in front of you here to tell my story. And what I'm trying to make a point, my biggest lesson throughout this whole journey of starting Women for Women International, working in different wars, in eight war zones, uh, in post-conflicts, uh, working with the horror of the world, it is at the end of the day about our own journey. As individuals, as a country, as a nation, as a society, it doesn't matter. It is like what Charlie said. If we do not save Afghanistan, we do not save America. If we do not uh, stabilize Iraq, we do not stabilize America. It is all connected, it is about us. Each one of us has a story and unless we break that silence, and unless we scream and shout and tell the whole world and the neighbors, we are stuck in this vicious cycle. So I'm a big uh, um, lover of Rumi, and Rumi is a 13th century Sufi poet. And in one of my favorite poems by him uh, is where he says, out beyond the walls of right doings and wrong doings, there is a field, I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in that field, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other no longer makes any sense. I do hope you join me in the field if you are not in the field already. So thank you.